Hello and welcome to the National Security Conversation. For the past three years and perhaps more, India's neighbor to the south, Sri Lanka, has been spiraling into an unmitigated economic disaster. Sri Lanka's economy was not in great shape to begin with. The Rajapaksha government's decision to implement deep tax cuts in 2019 hurt the government's coffers in a big way. The COVID-19 pandemic dried up both the revenue from tourism at home and remittances from Sri Lankan workers abroad. But let's go back a bit because in many ways the root causes of the current crisis go back more than a decade. Sri Lanka's original donors such as the United States, Japan and the IMF among others drastically reduced their economic support in response to the Sri Lankan army's ruthless suppression of the Tamil rebels which killed scores of civilians. Because of India's unwillingness to support Sri Lanka's war against the LTTE, the Chinese saw a strategic opening. Under the increasing economic patronage of China, Sri Lanka failed to carry out essential economic reforms and ended up becoming the case study in Chinese debt trap diplomacy. Before the year of COVID began, the Easter Sunday bombings of 2019 sent the country's tourism revenues into decline from $4.38 billion in 2018 to $3.59 billion in 2019, a big deal for a country over 12% of whose GDP is dependent on tourism. The long mismanagement of the country's economy did not cease even after the impact of COVID. In a series of unthoughtful moves, the Sri Lankan government banned all chemical fertilizers in April 2021 which put the farming sector of the country under great distress. The move was later reversed, but the damage had already been done to the country's agriculture sector. In the final instance, the Russian invasion of Ukraine earlier in February proved to be the proverbial last straw that broke the camel's back. The war put an end to Russian and Ukrainian tourists, which accounted for 25% of international arrivals in Sri Lanka between January and mid-February this year. The Russian misadventure sent the Sri Lankan rupee crashing against the US dollar, while at the same time, it took the crucial Western attention away from Sri Lanka, which otherwise might have come to Colombo's aid in this time of need. Since then, a severe shortage of foreign reserves forced the government to cut down on essential imports, including fuel, rampant power cuts that lasted up to 13 hours debilitated whatever remained of Sri Lanka's industrial output. Months of blackouts and food and medicine shortages have brought widespread suffering to the ordinary Sri Lankans and precipitated a full-blown political crisis. By the end of March this year, protesters had tried to storm President Gotabaya Rajapaksha's residence demanding his resignation and a curfew was imposed in Colombo. As the protests spread, in another ill-thought-out and poorly executed decision, the president imposed a state of emergency on the 1st of April, granting the security forces sweeping powers to detain and arrest protesters. Immediately afterwards, a 36-hour nationwide curfew was declared and the troops were deployed. The government also blocked access to social media, but the country's Human Rights Council ruled against the ban and it was revoked. In yet another blow to the current government's legitimacy, almost the entire cabinet resigned between the 3rd and 5th of April, leaving the Rajapakshas isolated and the government without a majority in the parliament. The state of emergency was lifted after widespread protests. This situation continues to today. The opposition blames the government and there is widespread public anger against the Rajapaksha clan, which has off and on ruled Sri Lanka for almost two decades now. The protests demanding their resignation have entered its second month. Although the Rajapaksha duo, Gotabaya and Mahinda have resisted, three other Rajapakshas stepped down from their positions in the Sri Lankan cabinet. Moving from domestic politics to geopolitics, Sri Lanka has over the past decade become a key theater for contestation between China, which wants to gain a strategic foothold in the Indian Ocean region, and India, which wants to maintain its regional primacy. While China has been receiving a lot of bad press over the ongoing crisis in Sri Lanka, India has been trying to gain lost ground and enhance goodwill 
in the country. Although both countries have been offering aid, New Delhi has been especially active diplomatically with Colombo since the onset of the crisis. India has already extended credit lines amounting to $3 billion through fuel and medicine supplies, medicine supplies, loan deferments and currency swaps. Both China and India realize the strategic significance of this seemingly but strategically vital island nation. It is a moment of strategic rethinking for Beijing as its mercantilist policies have not borne the desired dividends. For New Delhi, the crisis presents an opportunity to help a neighbor in need and revitalize its relations with Sri Lanka and send a strong positive signal to other states in the region that have shown a desire to play the Chinese harp. If India plays its cards right, it can rebalance its equation with China in the region and gain vital ground. The ongoing economic crisis in Sri Lanka is the worst in its independent history. And by all estimates, ordinary Sri Lankans will have to bear it for two more years and probably spend many more years making up for the losses they have incurred. It also comes at a crucial moment of a geopolitical influx in South Asia, namely the rise of China and India's effort to balance it. To discuss the Sri Lankan crisis and understand its consequences for the country, its people and for South Asian geopolitics, I have with me Dr. George Cook. He is a diplomat historian and a senior lecturer at the Department of International Relations, University of Colombo, Sri Lanka. Dr. Cook, um, welcome to the National Security Conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for having me on the program. Right. You know, uh, what is your assessment of what is happening in Sri Lanka today? Uh, do give us a comprehensive picture of whatever is unfolding there. Um, remember, this is an Indian audience primarily. So uh, give us a little background and how you assess and understand what's going on there in Sri Lanka today. Sure. So Sri Lanka is facing one of its worst crises that we have ever faced in our history. And I'm talking about a period of seven decades, seven and a half decades. We have not come to a crunch point where we've been waiting for a ship to call in at the Colombo Harbour with fuel. We have not come to a point where our foreign reserves have gone down terribly. We have not come to a point where we are waiting for some kind of assistance to come from another country. This is why I call this a national crisis. We have really hit rock bottom at this point. This has been going on for quite some time. We've been gradually, the situation has been worsening and we've been gradually moving to the position that we are in right now. If we look at what has been happening in the last year, the last two years, you know, we've been hit by COVID on one side, but countries around the world were hit by COVID. India herself was hit by COVID in a very, very bad way. But countries are rebounding, countries are resilient, countries are moving ahead. We are facing an economic crisis that has now expanded into a national crisis. So whether you start off with looking at having an issue when it came to foreign exchange and the low amount of foreign exchange, that led to the inability to buy fuel, that has affected electricity supplies, we have power cuts on a daily basis, there are queues, people lining up to get gas, people lining up to get petrol and diesel and kerosene, people are looking at alternate forms in order to move ahead to try to make sure that they're able to get through each particular day. So the situation has really reached a very, very unfortunate point. And this is because there has been a lack of strategy, a lack of direction, a lack of correct, clear policies that have been adopted. Things have gone wrong. And leaders have admitted it. Leaders have admitted that mistakes have been made. We did not go to the IMF in time. We took an agriculture policy, which has crippled the agriculture sector of this country by banning fertilizer. Personally, I feel it is a very good policy to move into more natural forms of fertilizer. But you must be mindful, you can't do it overnight. Right. Everything needs to be phased out. You need to do it in a gradual basis. You have to have stakeholders on board. People who are actually out there farming need to be part of the equation. Right. Dr. Cook, Dr. Cook um, you know, very quickly, I mean, um, how do normal people and not so well off people, uh, how are they coping with this crisis on a daily basis? Um, if you can sort of describe that to us so that we get an understanding of what's happening really on the ground. The cost of living has gone up drastically. The cost of medicine has gone up drastically. And not only the cost going up, you also have a situation in which there is a scarcity. There was in the last few months people looking for rice. I have personally walked from shop to shop looking for rice at one particular point last year. We now have a situation in which we have medicines in shortage. 
and countries like India have come forward. You saw when Minister Jai Shankar was in Sri Lanka uh, a few weeks ago, hmm. he even saw a tweet that had come out with regard to a severe lack of medicine in one of our leading hospitals in this country, and he responded. But there are so many other hospitals out there that are facing these situations. People on the ground, people at the grassroots level, those who are daily wage earners are facing a huge problem. How do you get through three meals? Can you afford three mm. meals? Many people can't. Can you afford two meals? They're hoping that they can. Are we concerned now about nutrition levels? Are we ensuring a nutritious diet? I'm sorry, that right. is left aside right now. People right. are trying to make sure that they can meet their hunger. Why are people protesting today? People who are out there on the road are not protesting because they belong to X political party or Y political party. People are out there because it has hit them economically, it has hit their stomachs. They are finding it hard to get through each and every day. Right. And this is where people in various sectors are being affected across the board. This is not something that is only affecting those who are in very low income categories. However, they are facing it the worst. Because when you look at the kilo of rice, the, a kilo of sugar, when you look at dal, dal is something that is very common in terms of our diet here right. in Sri Lanka. Right. Look at the way the prices have skyrocketed. Right. How do people cope with that situation? Doctor, Dr. Cook, uh, I know this is not the time for blame game, but um, you know, in democracies, it is important to sort of uh, call people to account. So, who do you blame for blame blame uh, for this crisis? Um, do you think the uh, government led by the Rajapakshas have a lot to do with it, or this is a um, systemic crisis that has been brewing uh, for a very long time? What's your take on that? I want to make two points here. One point is when it comes to looking at policies that we have been adopting over the last several decades, leaders have always looked to the next election. They have looked to sustaining themselves and being in power until the next election and hoping to get re-elected at that particular point. That has been one of the biggest issues that we have faced in this country where we have not had people looking at the long term not doing things which are going to impact our country, our people in the long term, improve our position in the global community. Sadly, that has not happened. And that is something that we need to point out and state very clearly. Secondly, the current administration that came into power came in in 2019. Now, this is where you are promising security, you're promising prosperity, you're promising people that you will take them on to a better level. Yes, COVID struck. COVID struck lots of countries, as I mentioned earlier on, around the world. It didn't only happen to Sri Lanka. So other countries are bouncing back. Other countries are moving ahead. Why is Sri Lanka not doing that? Very poor economic planning. We have not strategized. We have not looked at the future. We have not looked at targets. We have not looked at how we are going to achieve them. As a result, we have fallen short. Take the IMF, for example. Yes, countries are rather concerned in going to the IMF. There are strictures that the IMF lays down, and there are reasons for that. The IMF sets conditions because they want to ensure that they are repaid as well. They don't exactly. want to go bankrupt at the end of the day by giving money out to countries. They wouldn't want to do that with any country. They'll do that with us. They'll do that with any country around the world. Now, why didn't we go to them earlier? Because people at the top realized, no, we have a different solution. Just two months ago, I was on a program with India where uh, we had a certain senior bureaucrat in this country saying it's a small issue. We will find a homegrown solution. Their bureaucrat is not in office anymore. That bureaucrat has had to eat his own words because we've gone to the IMF now. But you can't expect the IMF to come on board and give you a blank check and say, yes, go ahead. Here's the money. Do whatever you want to do with it. You seem to make the argument that this is a problem that has been unfolding, developing for a very long time, say for the last several decades. Uh, but the public anger seems to be against the Rajapaksha administration. So if you were to sort of cut to the present, uh, to the past few years, how do you evaluate the performance of the current administration, um, which may or may not have caused um, this, this crisis at this point of time? The president has admitted that mistakes have been made. He has admitted two mistakes. One was not going to the IMF fast enough. The second was on his agriculture policies. Now, these are important steps. Once you know what your mistakes are, you must go ahead and correct them. But you must also decide to step down at that point. If it's in the corporate sector, exactly. shareholders hold their CEO, they hold their management responsible. We are holding our leaders responsible. Exactly. You know, if you want to have an iota of dignity, you want to have a chance of coming back in the future, step down. You have failed. It's human. We all fail. We all have mistakes. We all make errors. But this is a country that we are talking about. You can't mess around with the country. A private company, you might be able to do something and get it going once again. This is a country at stake. You're talking about 
22 million people on this island. This is not a country that was created last year. This is not a country that is a new player on the world stage. This is a historically enriched country, which has long traditions, long heritage, but all of that comes to nothing at the end of the day when right. you have poor economic policies and your people are starving. Right. You know, Dr. Cook, you just pointed out a little while ago that uh, this public anger is across the board. This is not just by the opposition parties, clearly. A lot of people are unhappy about it. And yet, uh, President Rajapaksha is unwilling to resign, as you just pointed out. Where does he draw his source of support? Or wh who is really supporting him? Uh, why does he think he can get away with it? That's a very good question. Where does he draw his support from? This is where I go down to something very basic. When you become a leader of a country, whoever it may be, wherever it may be in the world, you are not aware, you are not an expert. You don't have expertise in every sector. Exactly. You've got to surround yourself with people who are going to guide you, help you, caution you. I would even go to the extent of saying warn you if they feel that you're doing something wrong. But if you surround yourself with yes men who are going to agree to everything you say and do your bidding, that's going to be the day that you're going to start going down a very slippery slope. And sadly, that has happened in this country. It's not only this particular family or this particular president, a lot of leaders in the past too have surrounded themselves with people who are yes men who have agreed to everything they have said. Now, that's something that you've got to be really worried about. You don't have your ear to the ground. You don't understand the ground reality. You don't feel the beat at the grassroots levels. This is where we have gone wrong. This is where leaders have been completely uh, ostracized from their people. They have been completely disconnected. They are not in queues. They are not facing shortages. They are not facing power cuts. They don't understand the reality. And sadly, people around them are giving them some kind of assurance that, no, we can get through this. Let's wait for the protest to end. It will end at some point. Because for a long time, protests in Sri Lanka would start in the morning and end by evening or start in the afternoon, end by evening. That's not happening anymore. Protests, people who are coming out to protest are not coming from political parties. A majority of them are people who are coming out there because they feel this is wrong. Enough is enough. The people can't keep going through these kind of situations anymore. This is where there has been a national awakening in Sri Lanka, so to say. This is a country that is identified as one of the oldest democracies in this part of the world. Finally, we are walking the talk. Finally, we are awakening to a national consensus where we realize, no, we can't take any more of it. It has got to stop. You can't keep putting right. economic pressures on people, asking them to tighten their belts when you are continuing to spend frivolously. Right. Dr. Cook, I mean, you know, coming back to that question again, you know, on the 3rd of May, the uh, the principal opposition party, uh, the SJP actually filed a no-conference motion against uh, SLPP coalition government led, led by Rajapaksha. Now, uh, one is not sure what's going to happen to that. Uh, but to sort of, again, in the context of this, to repeat what I asked you earlier, where is he drawing his support from? Or is he isolated? Uh, do you see fa uh, factions within the government supporting him? Do you see the military supporting him? Uh, wh what, what sort of emboldens him to stay back in the, uh, in, the, in the prime minister's seat? Certainly holding that position of chief of all militaries, mm. it is a very uh, reassuring position that he has. And that is a huge strength that he has at the end of the day. But at the same time, there are members who are around him, members of parliament, people from his own party, people from parties which have come into coalition with him, who are giving him some degree of strength and reassurance that they will help him get through this particular period. They are advising him accordingly, and he's taking decisions in accordance with what they are saying. But also, he needs to bear in mind that we have never seen mass protests of this nature. I'm not only talking about that which is happening in Colombo go around the country. There are protests from farmers, from teachers, from people at the very grassroots level who are out there on the streets. Why are they protesting? They're not doing that just to get some kind of international attention or hit the headlines. They're not doing that. They're doing that because they're affected. Now, if you're the leader, surely you hear the news, you see the papers, you know what's happening. Are you completely being closeted from all of that? Are you completely shut out from all of that? You're not, right? You've got to be really thick to think that uh, everything's going to be okay. People are really going through a very tough time right now. We have, as I said at the very beginning, it is unprecedented. It is unprecedented. And people at the very top must realize you need to have some kind of semblance of feeling for the people. 
for what they are going through. Right. We Dr. need to come out and speak genuinely. Right. Dr. Cook, to, that uh, was two, not happening. Two, two additional questions. One, what is your prediction um, about the no confidence motion uh, against the SLPP coalition government? And two, uh, should there be a um, no conference motion? If that becomes successful, is the president required constitutionally to step down from the position of prime minister, the president? So there are two no confidence motions that have been presented in parliament by uh, some of the opposition parties. Now, one is calling for the government, a no confidence motion in the government. The other is a no confidence in the president. Now, the second one does not have legal weightage. You have got to impeach, if at all, uh, exactly. just passing a motion of no confidence is not going to see him stepping down. You've got to go through the entire rigorous, complex, complicated process of impeachment, which President Jaya Jayabharadana put into the constitution and made it extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. We saw an earlier attempt to impeach President Ranasinghe Premadasa, and that did not succeed. So impeachment is a very long road, uh, one which uh, many uh, political parties would not want to go down simply because of the uh, loopholes that are there in it. There's no check and balance, sadly, in that particular process. It is supposed to be the case, but it is not. Uh, going back to your first question, in terms of um, do you, how do we see this playing out? Let's take what happened on the 5th of May. There was the election of the Deputy Speaker of Parliament. The Deputy Speaker resigned. He's from the Sri Lanka Freedom Party. He resigned. He then uh, submits his letter of resignation. We then have an election in parliament. He is a candidate in that election once again. Now, why did you resign in the first place? If you're going to put yourself forward as a candidate once again. So he comes forward as a candidate. The opposition puts forward another veteran politician as a candidate. Uh, one side gets 148. This is just drama. We wasted millions of rupees on the 5th of May, 2022 in parliament, just having an election for someone who was already holding that position. What were you trying to do? What were you trying to do? So there are various accusations going between the government, between dissident parties, between independent groups, which are claiming to be independent, and I'll use independent with an inverted commas there, uh, between the opposition, the SJB, whoever it may be. There are a lot of accusations being traded back and forth. The opposition did not canvass sufficiently. Uh, you have a former prime minister saying there are two opposition candidates, which is obviously not the case. Uh, you see the government heavily supporting one particular candidate. Now, all of this is unraveling. You see, this is an indication of what is going to happen with the no confidence motion as well. Right. But at the end of the day, the no confidence motion is going to show the people of this country who is with them hmm. and who is with right. the family. Right, right. Um, you know, you, you mentioned sort of several um, uh, long-term causes behind this crisis, but I would you agree with me that uh, the... Um, COVID crisis um, was a major reason behind the uh, the current uh, um, you know, problems in Sri Lanka, as well as uh, probably the Russian war against Ukraine. Um, so how do you sort of evaluate the impact of the COVID um, on the current crisis, as well as the um, uh, Russian war in Ukraine, which may have actually um, caused problems for the Sri Lankan rupee and the economy? So the common denominator between COVID and Russia, Ukraine is tourism. This right. is where COVID saw a drop in tourism, uh, Russia, Ukraine, another drop in tourism, a drastic drop. If you look at statistics from the last six months, eight months, we had a large influx of tourists from Russia and from Ukraine, Ukraine. quite interesting. Now, this is obviously going to get depleted, probably come down to zero because those two countries have other things to worry about. I don't think people in either country are planning to go on holiday right now. Uh, so that is a huge uh, blow on the economy. Secondly, when it came to COVID, yes, but this is something that countries around the world face. The Maldives face this even more probably. The Maldives is so dependent on tourism. The Maldives are doing pretty well. They're rebound, they're resilient, they're moving ahead. But there's something else that happened which really impacted, and that was a wrong policy decision in order to cut taxes. 2019. Yeah. And you promise people that you're going to cut taxes. People are thrilled to bits. So you're losing a massive source of income. Now you're going to not only hike the prices, now you're going to bring in the uh, taxes. You're going to burden the people even more. You are really reaching a crunch point here. So definitely COVID had an impact. Russia, Ukraine had an impact to some extent, especially with regard to tourism. It is also impacting with regard to fuel prices in the world. That is also an indirect impact on the Sri Lankan economy right now. 
But one of the big things you must never forget is the tax cuts that took place at the beginning of this administration. Which actually the current finance minister Ali Sabri recently called a historic mistake and he said that we won't be able to resolve this crisis in two years, uh, which means we are probably looking at a long term implication of this, right? So you see, they are admitting their mistakes. They are admitting the mistakes that you have made. Once you have admitted it, it's great. It's superb. I really applaud them mm. for coming forward and saying we've made a mistake. That's the first step towards correcting a mistake. But you've also got to realize if you made that mistake, you cannot continue. You cannot go ahead. You need to move aside because you are going to make more blunders as you go forward. And you don't want that. We don't want that as a country. We don't want to see that happen. Right. You know, um, um, last month, um, the Sri Lankan government announced uh, to default, um, the decision to default on its entire external debt of something like $51 billion as a last resort. What implications do you think this will have for the uh, macroeconomic situation in the country? I mean, not just for the people at large, but for, um, for the country as a whole going forward. It is very concerning. Put, our, put ourselves into the shoes of countries out there countries which are granting assistance. They're now going to think, okay, so Sri Lanka unilaterally decides that they're going to default. No consultation, no seeking a moratorium, mm. no seeking assistance. Now we are starting to do that. But also at the same time, we also see that Sri Lanka didn't have any other choice at that point. That's right. We didn't have any more money to pay. But there are ways and means to avoid that, to avert that situation. You need to be consulting much more with countries in the neighborhood, much more with countries out there in the world, with international financial organizations. We need to have been doing that in a much more proactive way. We are now reacting to the situation. So one of the basic things that comes out of this uh, decision to default on all our debt is that in future, countries are going to think twice right. about giving us assistance. Right. India has given so much uh, India probably realizes that repayment is going to take some time. Hmm. It's probably not going to come within the time frame that it is supposed to be repaid in. Dr. Cook, if I, right. Dr. Cook, if I may ask you, how many countries have actually stepped up to help Sri Lanka in this time of need? Uh, I know India is there. I realize that China has also been active. What about the European Union, the United States of America? Are they too busy with uh, what's happening in Ukraine? Um, how do you sort of assess the a support given by the international community at this point of time? So from Europe, we've heard of Italy coming forward and providing assistance. We have Indonesia. We're also hearing of Bangladesh providing emergency medical assistance. We've had China providing assistance. But what we need to be seeing happening much more proactively is reaching out to countries with which we have historic connectivity, trade connectivity, asking those countries for assistance at this particular juncture. I know it's taking the begging bowl and going out there around the world. But we are not on our knees anymore. I feel we are completely flat on the ground. Right. This is not a situation where we are slipping and we need to be cautious. We've slipped. We've fallen. We really need that assistance right now. But you need that assistance also to come in in such a way that it's going to help people. It's going to boost the economy. You need to hopefully see, and this is where countries, countries have to hold Sri Lanka and Sri Lankan authorities accountable for every dollar that they send here. Don't settle for anything less. If you are sending money into this country, make sure that it is going into very important projects, people's food, medicine, shortages, addressing those terms in the short term. But also looking at the long term picture, investment in industries that are going to give us ways and means of getting out of this situation. Energy being one of those very critical factors. Something I've been advocating for a long time is looking at the Indian model, looking at renewable energy, looking at solar, looking at wind, looking at wave, whatever it may be. We need to be looking at that long-term picture as well. Yes, we have a crisis at the moment which we have to resolve, but we've also got to think of the bigger picture of where we need to get to. How are we going to avert these situations recurring in the future? Right. This is Dr. something that we are not focusing on. Right. Dr. Cook, you know, I was, uh, you just mentioned that not too many countries are actually stepping, at, uh, stepping up in order to help Sri Lanka. I was looking at the um, you know, the, the assistance pattern uh, since the end of the Elam War, um, the LTT uh, versus the Sri Lankan government. Uh, for the last 12 years or so, the traditional uh, uh, lenders or creditors or countries who have been helping Sri Lanka 
stepped back, uh, you know, accusing Sri Lanka of human rights violations during the, uh, you know, final onslaught against the LTT, as it were. Um, so that has that, you know, is that is that in some sense repeating? Uh, have the have these countries, the United States or EU, for that matter, have they not really warmed up to uh, the, the Sri Lankan government yet? Uh, is there a, is there a memory of what happened at that point of time, and therefore they're still not um, uh, willing to help Sri Lanka? Or uh, am I reading that correctly? What's your what's your take? This is where if you go back to 2009, 2010, for example, you had Sri Lanka losing GSP plus. Right. This was something that really hit entrepreneurs, people at the grassroots level, producers, garment factories, uh, people who had started businesses providing employment to so many. If you were small to medium scale, you had to shut down. Right. Now, did the European Union at that point teach a lesson to the government or did it punish the people of this country? Mm. You punished the people of this country. Exactly. That government was re-elected at the next election with a larger majority. It was right after uh, the fighting in the conflict ended. So sometimes countries also take measures which do not actually benefit the people. If you want to engage with the country, do that in a very proactive way so that the people are not going to be hit. You want to impose some kind of sanctions on the leaders. If you have a problem with that, do that with them. Don't hit the country. Don't hit the economy. And this is where Sri Lanka then turns to one country. And what we saw in the period from 2010 to 2015 was over-reliance. I will use that term over-reliance on one country because right. that country was willing to come forward. Other countries were not. But let's take 2015 to 2019. You have, for example, the US Secretary of State flying into Sri Lanka in 2015, shortly after the government changed. John Kerry was here, patted the government on the back and left. Where was the investment? Where was the support? Hmm. It was moral support. You see, we, we, we're expecting things to be much more tangible. That government that came in said, we're going to stop the Lotus pro Tower project. We're going to stop the Port City project. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the Chinese said, sure, okay, go ahead. We've got Gwada. We're going to look at Gwada. We'll develop a Gwada port. Uh, that's an entry point. We don't uh, need to focus here. We can look at other options. One and a half years later, Sri Lanka is going back to China. The prime minister went to Davos, not from Colombo, went to Davos and called the Chinese to come back and invest. Because he also realized there was no other investment coming from any other quarters. So governments had changed. Governments had changed, but yet it wasn't coming. On that point about the Colombo City project, uh, Port City project, uh, there was also um, you know, some news about Sri Lanka displacing uh, India and Japan from that particular project and getting China back in. Um, what, what sort of course is that? So that is to do with the harbor. That is to do with the harbor, uh, and that is one of the terminals that was to be given. It was supposed to be a joint India-Japanese uh, conglomerate coming together in order to run that particular terminal. Now, they're to be re-enedged on that process, which was something very wrong. Hmm. That shouldn't have been done. Uh, in the long term, uh, this is a point that I uh, like to raise. Hamban Thota has been virtually uh, taken over to be run. Uh, to be used by the Chinese. But of course, they've also opened up free trade zones, other facilities yeah. there, which they're asking international investors to come and invest in. So far, we have not seen that. The Chinese can't go around selling it, marketing it, and telling others, come. Sri Lanka should be doing it in a much more proactive way. We can't depend on the Chinese to do it and then say, oh, the Chinese are taking over. That's a very wrong thing from a Sri Lankan point of view. And that's where I, I don't agree with this term, debt trap, diplomacy, etc. Because we ask, they give. Let's not fault the giver. They are giving because they have some kind of motive. They have something to gain in the process. We ask, they keep giving. We've got to know to use everything that we get in a very proactive manner. Of course, coming back to Colombo, what you're going to see in the future, in the months, in the years ahead, is how we have had at the Colombo Harbor, the largest amount of vessels calling have been from India. The second largest have been from Japan you have China coming in third. Now, if China is going to be operating out of Hambantata, China will make sure that their vessels call at Hambantata. China's structure is such that they can give such directives and it will be followed. Other countries, all of them can't do that. That is the Chinese model. Now, you are now telling the Indians and Japanese, sorry, we're not going to give you that terminal. You know, you're, you're yeah. losing out on yeah. something very big. If the Indians and Japanese come and invest in there, they've got vested interest. They will make it work. They will make it operate. They will make it more effective. You know, Dr. Cook, when I talk to uh, colleagues in Sri Lanka, friends in Sri Lanka, uh, I get mixed messages. On the one hand, they say, listen, you know, some of our biggest 
um, um, roads have been built, highways have been built by the Chinese. Before the Chinese came in, we didn't have many of these uh, many of these uh, highways. Uh, on the other hand, I think the recent uh, uh, controversy about the import of fertilizers, Chinese fertilizers, to uh, Colombo has, I think, created some sort of bad bad blood between uh, the two governments. Um, although. The Chinese seem to sort of say that this is about, you know, this is about government to government uh, um, uh, problem. I think the pre people also now realize that there is a cost to doing business with Chinese. Now, or am I exaggerating it as, as an Indian sitting in Delhi? Uh, am, I, am I sort of biased in my, in my sort of assessment of this? How do Sri Lankans objectively look at the Chinese involvement in the country and the Indian involvement in the country? China has been involved with Sri Lanka for centuries. We can go back to the time of Ahi and then the visits and things like that from a historic perspective. But you can come to more modern times. 1952, rubberized pact, for example. The first agreement between a communist and non-communist country. We have history with this country. 1957, SWRD Bandar Naika establishes diplomatic relations with China and with the Soviet Union. We'll never forget the fact that when it comes to the Security Council in the United Nations, China and Russia have stood by Sri Lanka through thick and thin, irrespective of who has been in power, which political party has been controlling the government. That is something that we have to take note of. Whether it was an SLFP-led government or coalition or UNP-led government, uh, any government that has been in power, the Chinese and the Russians have done. But remember, you can't take them for granted. They're not going to be there always. You've also got to play ball with them. You've got to make sure that you are... Uh, amenable, you are able to respond to their demands, their requests, whatever it may be. Now, when you look at the last 20 years, if you look at that period from the late 90s to the current period, we have seen China getting more and more involved in the world, not only in Sri Lanka. They have aggressively gone out there. That has happened probably in the last nine years on a much larger scale with the BRI. But the Chinese are doing this. They're just building on history. They're just building on those relations. Hmm. They're building on their economic system, their political structure of governance. They are going out there and doing that. From a Sri Lankan point of view, we have to realize that anyone coming, investing, it's great that the Chinese have provided the highways. It's great that they have helped us uh, with infrastructure development. But all of it comes at a cost. Yeah. All of it comes at a cost. And then people say, you're burdening the next generation. You're burdening an unborn generation with these debts. But at the same time, let us not forget that this generation won't take the highways when they die. Those highways are going to be there, hopefully in the long term. Hopefully it's going to be strong. Hopefully it's going to last. I'm using this word hopefully continuously. Right? That is what we hope right, will right. happen. But what we also must be mindful there is from a Sri Lankan point of view, we have a very important economic linkage with China, which we have to respect. We have very important political links with India. We have a very important trade link with the Americans, with the European Union. We've got to be mindful of because we are a small country. We are not some large player on the world stage. We are a very small country. We've got to be mindful that other countries have other issues to deal with. Sri Lanka is just one item on their agenda. We are not topping the agenda. That is something that the sooner we realize, the better it will be. Right, Dr. Cook, I mean, you know, let's look at the big picture here. The big picture really is that there is now the Quad, there is the Indo-Pacific as it were, um, and Sri Lanka is right in the um, um, confluence in some ways of these two, um, coming together of these two oceans. Uh, there is increased activity, maritime activity in the Indian Ocean region, in the South, East, South China Sea, uh, um, in, the, in the Indian Indo-Pacific in general. And, uh, you know, there is, there is a lot of talk about a... A strategic competition between India and China in the region, including uh, in the in the Indian Ocean region and in in Sri Lanka. At least that's how sort of we tend to uh, view um, um, you know the the developments in the region. Now, sitting in Colombo, um, how do you view the whole um, a gamut of issues I just described, from Quad to Indo-Pacific to India-China strategic competition uh, in the region, including in Sri Lanka? This is where it is not in Sri Lanka's interest to try to play one against the other, to try to talk one against the other, to try to deal with one against the other. That is not in Sri Lanka's interest. Sri Lanka is not a country that has the capacity to do that. 
We are not a country that they are highly dependent on. We do have our geography. We've been reiterating geography and the importance of our position for a long time. Other countries realize their position. That is why the Portuguese, Dutch, and the British were here. They weren't here by accident. That is why even at independence, the British military was so hesitant to give us independence, although the political hierarchy was willing to do that because they were losing a very important node. They had now given independence to India. They were now losing uh, Ceylon as well. So certainly Sri Lanka is in a very crucial position. Now, if those countries realize the importance of our location, how much more we must realize it? How uh, Shiv Shankar Menon has written about Sri Lanka being a launch pad just so many kilometers away from India. I mean, India realizes the significance of Ceylon. When the Japanese bombed Ceylon in the Second World War, Winston Churchill said that was the most dangerous moment in the Second World War. And you might think, hold on, London was bombed, France was taken over, and this is Pearl Harbor was attacked, and this is the most dangerous moment? Yes, because this would have been the launch pad to attack India, take over the jewel in the crown. One of the right. most important assets that they had in the British Empire at that particular point in terms of getting through the Second World War. But all of that makes us realize that whether it's the BRI, whether it is going to be uh, the Quad, whether it is AUKUS and what they're trying to do in the Indian Ocean and how they're trying to get together, Sri Lanka has a role to play with all of these groupings. Why? Because we trade with them, we have history with them, we have political relations with them, we have good diplomatic connectivity with them. You so, don't want so, so to take you, one side or the other right, so, and so, then find that those two are working together and you're caught out. Right, Sri Lanka so, does so not want say, to be in that position. You would say, Dr. Cook, therefore, Sri Lanka should, you know, to sort of go back to the, um, uh, the famous uh, terminology, terminology that we use in India, should be non-aligned and should not really get into any of the, any of the several camps. Uh, Sri Lanka should be able to uh, meet its needs, strategic or economic or material needs from all of these countries. And therefore, it's probably not a good, good idea to get into one or the other camp. So in that context, do you think the government of Sri Lanka uh, in Colombo is doing pretty much that? Or do you, do, you, do, you, do you have a feeling that they're probably getting too close to the Chinese? At least that's how it's perceived here in Delhi. Is that a sense that you share? Well, as to whether we've been getting too close to China in the last year and a half, I doubt it very much. Okay. Feathers have been ruffled so much so that at the beginning of this year, the Chinese foreign minister deemed it necessary to come to Colombo and try to ease things a bit. Now, that's China. I don't think the Chinese foreign minister should be coming to Colombo to try to ease relations with this tiny country in the world. We should be the ones reaching out to China and trying to ease relations if there is any kind of tension or anxiety. It should be the other way around. This is where we have a lot to learn from these countries. These countries have strategy, they have vision, they know where they want to go, they know what they want to achieve. Right. Of course, you also got to understand their structures are different. They're not looking at the next election. They've got different agendas, different ways in which they're going about achieving those objectives. But certainly, we've got to realize that non-alignment was a very, very important policy back in the day for a reason. The world had divided. I don't need to tell you, but Jawaharlal Nehru speaking at Bandung, he said, and I paraphrase it, aren't you ashamed? You've come out of colonialism. Do you want to go under another form of subjugation? Right. He said, India will go it alone. But at the same time, India can do that because of size. Sri Lanka can't. And that was where for countries like Sri Lanka, non-alignment was so important. We need to look at that in the global context of what is happening in the world today. We need all countries. We need all countries. No country has been 100% non-aligned. Let us also be quite clear about that. Uh, very famously, a former Sri Lankan president said that the only two non-aligned countries in the world uh, were the Americans and the Soviet Union at that point. <laughs> the others have all been aligned at some stage of our history. I get your personal view, Dr. Cook, that Sri Lanka should be non-aligned. Sri Lanka should be uh, looking after its interests. Do you think the government of Sri Lanka is doing that? Very valid point there. Have we done it? Have we not done it? We are not doing it right now. We are not reaching out to all countries. You see, we are taxing, for example, India continuously. Something I've said before, Indian leaders must be dreading phone calls from Colombo because it's asking for more assistance, asking for more help, asking for some kind of aid package. And India has been doing this on a continuous basis. There are some, of course, like I must tell you, in Colombo, in Sri Lanka, who are skeptical. And they're like, oh, why is India doing this? What are India's interests? What does India want to get out of it? And my response to that is, hold on, you don't have a choice. <laughs> it's a good thing that India is coming forward and helping. Otherwise, 
uh, we won't even have the current uh, form of existence that we enjoy on the island. This is what we need to be conscious of. People have to be that much more aware. India and Sri Lanka are democracies. The Americans need to be doing a lot more in this particular situation. You keep pointing fingers, and I'm talking about the, the US structure, they keep pointing fingers at Sri Lanka and saying, you are pro-Chinese, you are going too close to China. Right. Then come forward and invest, come forward and assist the country. I mean, forget the aid, trade more. You're trading already, which is great. Improve bilateral connectivity, irrespective right. of who is in power. Work with this country, invest in this country, have a stakeholder in this country. Don't just make pronouncements on this country. India is walking the talk in that sense. India is coming forward and doing things tangibly. Hence, India has a stake. India can open their mouth and speak. India can have a seat at this table and say, Sri Lanka, wake up, what are you doing? Right. right. So un right. until and unless people put their words into practice, especially countries out there in the West, until that happens, uh, we're not going to see Sri Lanka being able to adopt that non-aligned policy quite sadly. I'm not trying to justify the failure on the part of the government to adopt non-aligned policy, but you need to be more proactive. You need to right. be much more aggressive out there in terms of your foreign policy and your diplomatic engagement. Right. Dr. Cook, uh, forgive me for asking this question. How do Sri Lankans generally compare um, Sri Lanka's relationship with India and China? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm quite keen to know what you and your fellow Sri Lankans think about, say, India compared to China and vice versa. So I'll first talk about the Chinese connection. I mentioned earlier how China has supported us. Many Sri Lankans probably don't understand the complexity of international relations and what is happening out there in the world. So there is a certain degree of skepticism, especially because China, when they are constructed something, will bring workers from China. Mm. They will decide to uh, uh, be quite loud, quite vociferous out there, especially when they mingle with the people. Yeah. People have a certain degree of hesitation when it comes to a country like China. When it comes to a country like India, people are mindful of certain aspects. You know, for example, there was a protest recently that took place. Uh, and if you listen to the audios coming out of those, you hear people talking about Rajiv Gandhi. You hear people talking about 87. You hear people talking about the 13th Amendment. Now, that is where people are conscious. People are aware. So that is always in the back of their minds. But at the same time, this is a country with which Sri Lanka for example, let's go back to independence. I'm sorry to keep taking you back to history, but this is something very important to focus on. Why did the first prime minister of this country sign a defense pact with the United Kingdom? Here you want them to go. You want yeah. them to leave. But there was skepticism on the part of D.S. Serenayaka, who was also minister of defense, wondering whether he could defend the country. Why? Around 1945, Jawaharlal Nehru had made a statement in which he had said, oh, Ceylon, very much like one of our states, similar culture, similar tradition, similar norms. The prime minister here was shivering in his boots, not knowing India having lost territory for the creation of a new country, whether there would be any kind of eyes set on Sri Lanka and Ceylon being taken into an Indian federation. So there was doubt at the very beginning. Bandaranaika comes back. He's very good friends with Nehru. There's a very different chemistry between the two. Right. right. Relations are reaching a very different level. When it comes to an emergency, when it comes to a national tragedy, the yeah. first country to respond is India. We saw that after the tsunami. We've seen that when there have been floods, landslides, any kind of the current crisis too. This is something that has to be made uh, much clearer to people. People must be that much more aware of it. Dr. Cook, um, you know, you mentioned 13th Amendment. Um, how do you personally view the Indian insistence on the implementation of the 13th Amendment? So this is where India at that point felt, Rajiv Gandhi probably felt at that stage, that that was one of the most important things that were needed, devolution sharing of power in the country. But of course, we're, I need to take you back a decade. Let's go to the Bandaranaika Gandhi connection. Mrs. Gandhi, Mrs. Bandaranaika, very close to each other. I hear that the Indian bureaucracy takes a very different stance on Mrs. Bandaranaika. Jane Dixit, for example, writing about her, describes her as being very cunning. Uh, <laughs> and so that's because she was so friendly with Mrs. Gandhi that they were, for example, able to resolve ownership of Kachatibu. They were able to resolve a lot of other issues because of their closeness. But then one thing we've got to be careful in international relations and bilateral connectivity is when the pendulum swings to one extreme, 
it can swing to the other extreme. And that is what we saw with the advent of the Jaya Jaya Vardhana government. Right. Mrs. Gandhi, Jaya Jaya Vardhana do not get along. Mrs. Gandhi is very disappointed about the deprivation of civic rights of Mrs. Bandaranaika. She finds that as something personally done, a personal vendetta against her friend in Sri Lanka. Every Indian delegation that came to Sri Lanka in the early 80s would take this matter up with the government when she was actually a non-entity at that point in Sri Lanka. Mrs. Gandhi is also at that point aiding the training of the LTTE. These things are happening on Indian territory. This is something that is revealed later on. And then, of course, you have Rajiv Gandhi coming in and probably JR thought he can have a better relationship with Rajiv Gandhi. And Sri Lanka was virtually forced into this situation, especially because there had been a mass exodus of people into India. Right. You had an internationalization of the conflict with India coming at the forefront. Mrs. Gandhi going to the UN, there being a signature campaign out of Tamil Nadu, all of these things took place at that stage because India is now directly involved. India directly has to deal with refugees flowing into that country. But at the same time, we've hoped, we felt that with the devolution of power, we would see some kind of correction. Right. We had the provincial councils being brought in. So, so on, that, work? on the 13th on the Amendment, Amendment, where do you stand today? Where, where, where do you stand today? So uh, where do I stand on the 13th Amendment? Yes. So this is where we probably have not seen a full implementation of the 13th Amendment. At the moment, many provincial councils around the country have not had elections for a very long time. They're being run by governors uh, right. who are appointed by the executive. So whether it has been a success, whether it has not, has power been devolved in an effective way? Have we seen that happening? Questionable. We can have a debate on that. I personally don't think it has been implemented in the way in which it was probably envisaged by its drafters, the architects of it in the late 1980s. And there are several reasons for that, that we've also got to take on board. Right. You know, here's my last question, Dr. Cook, and that is about, you mentioned earlier on that you have disagreements with the term uh, debt trap diplomacy by the Chinese. Um, why do you say so? So this term debt trap diplomacy is a certain construct that has come out of a certain quarter of the world, uh, which has a lot of apprehensions about Sri Lanka taking loans from China, but has no problems with China investing in their own countries. So this is something that we've got to take on board. America, largest amount of bonds have been bought by the Chinese. Now, that is not debt trap diplomacy then? Oh, probably not because America is a very strong country. Maybe because Sri Lanka is much weaker, it is a problem when it comes to Sri Lanka. But let us not forget for a moment that China has not forcibly come and given a single cent. Grants, yes. Gifts, yes. That's a different picture. They built the BMICH, they've given hospitals, they've given other facilities. But everything that we have asked, they have given. If they are, you are not on the same level playing field at the end of the day. When you ask, when you borrow, when you take, you obviously move lower, they move higher. Right. This is a natural occurrence. You are not in a position on a personal level to go to your bank manager and say, I will set the terms and conditions of my loan. Thankfully for countries, we can negotiate. Personally, we can't negotiate. The bank will set a deal and we have to accept it. How good are we at negotiation? Have we done that effectively? And I will say a very big no. So at the end of the day, I'm going back to that main point. I mean, in response to your question, why do I say it is not debt trap diplomacy? All countries that give assistance, all countries that invest have an agenda. This is natural. Hmm. This is part of realism on the global stage in international relations. There's no such thing as a free lunch. But you've got to know when you get that assistance to use it in a very constructive manner. If you don't have the plan, if you don't have the strategy, don't blame the giver. But at the end of the day, using this term debt trap diplomacy, uh, our largest amount of debt is not owed to China. Right. Why do we not focus on the debt that we owe other countries? Why are we not owing, uh, talking about the debt that we owe international financial institutions, financial markets? Why aren't we talking about that? How come that is, so that is where that can be uh, a slightly colored, tinted view, that particular term, right. using that term debt trap diplomacy, because all countries who are giving assistance, who are giving aid, obviously there's something to gain. There's obviously something for them to benefit from at the end of the day. Right. Um, Dr. Cook, uh, very forthright, very frank, uh, very insightful. Thank you for joining me on this conversation. Get a sneak peek of exclusive content before everyone else for channel members only. Memberships start at Rs. 89. Hit the join button below.